Um, and thank you, the people who showed up. Um, today, uh, we're going to have a great tutorial about how to process code mixed text. It's going to be led by uh, Monoji Chaudhary um, and um, uh, Maud Sanazaki Rizvi. And um, they both have done lots of work in sort of code switching and code mixing. And uh, we're looking forward to their presentation today. So why don't you take it away? Thanks, Jan. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining the tutorial. Uh, so I'm Monojit and I'm a researcher. I was a researcher at Microsoft Research recently, but uh, I, very recently I moved to uh, another team. So that's why I just said I'm a researcher, but I, now I'm uh, in a product team. So I work on large language models. It's called the Turing team. Um, and while I share my screen, maybe Sanad, uh, you can also introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Sanat, and uh, I think last year I worked with Monojit closely on some of the work that we're going to talk about at Microsoft Research India. Right now I'm working at Google Research India, uh, working on cross-lingual video systems. So very excited to join today. Yep. So uh, without uh, further ado, let me get into the topic of uh, today's tutorial. So we are going to talk about processing code mixed texts and uh, what do I mean by code mixed texts? So uh, often, uh, you know, in multilingual societies where uh, at societal level, there are multiple languages which uh, people talk about in their day-to-day -day life, people tend to mix these languages. So it's not uh, about I being multilingual, uh, but staying in a, you know, with other people who are not multilingual. So it's about a societal phenomenon where everybody in the society is multilingual and kind of speak the same set of two or more languages. So then everybody understands those languages and people tend to mix them. Uh, and it's pretty common across the globe. Like you can see in this example uh, of tweets taken from different parts of the world. So we have, uh, you know, this is, I think, mix of German and Turkish. This is a mix of Spanish and English. This is a mix of, uh, uh, you know, Arabic and French and so on. So linguists call this code mixing or code switching where code means uh, not code as in a program, but a language and mixing or switching is obvious what it means. Uh, there is a subtle difference between what is mixing and what is switching, but for this tutorial and for most of the computational work that may not be so relevant. Uh, so we will ignore that. Now, what we are going to do in this tutorial is um, uh, I'll start with uh, a little bit of introduction about why processing code mixing is so important for computational social science. And uh, then I will, I mean, then we will do a hands-on session on a particular task, which is word level language detection, uh, which is very important first step for, mm, you know, any kind of code mix processing but also it itself is quite potent and help you doing uh, can help you do a lot of analysis and then of course there are advanced text processing methods which we won't have time to cover in this tutorial but i'll nevertheless talk about those a little bit so before i get into uh, the topics uh, i want to thank all my collaborators so uh, whatever I'm going to talk about, uh, we have been working on it since 2012, so 10 years now. So it's called Project Melange at Microsoft Research India. And there are a whole lot of people, I'm not going to read out their names. Um, it's all listed there, other than Sana than me, who have worked on various topics uh, related to code mixing and built various systems. A lot of them are, the data sets and systems are all available. So uh, we will, I mean, when we talk about the systems and hands-on tutorial, we will mm, take examples from those tools, but also I will leave you with resources uh, which exist in general and not only our work. So you know what this code mixing is. Some important things to know about code mixing is one is it happens in all multilingual societies. Uh, it's It's almost given that if it's a multilingual society, people are going to mix languages uh, and this is empirically known. Uh, 
it's predominantly a spoken language phenomenon. So usually people don't write uh, code mixed text. However, this has been changing recently. Uh, so it's associated with informal conversations. But since uh, we do a lot of informal conversations in textual mode these days, like chats, uh, most uh, on WhatsApp, on social media like Facebook or Twitter, or even if you look at comments that are on, um, you know, uh, let's say on some YouTube video or something. So you will see people are rampantly code mixing. So that's why it's important to process code mixing, especially if you are proce processing any social media data coming from a multilingual geography. And uh, some of you just joined right now. So I'll repeat what uh, I said uh, earlier, uh, which is uh, I was recently looking at uh, a WhatsApp forum where uh, many people, uh, it, these are, uh, you know, health-based WhatsApp forums uh, from Kenya, where uh, HIV positive youths uh, talk to each other. Uh, it's a peer support group. They describe their problems and all. So if you look at any, I mean, this is just one example, but uh, if you look at any such, you know, forums, peer support forums, etc., and if you are interested in researching on that, be it an ethnographic research, be it a computational research, you would see a lot of code mixing. For instance, we saw a lot of mixing between Swahili and then Sheng and English. So depending on what the geography you are looking at, uh, what's the demography, you will see different kinds of languages being mixed. But uh, mostly, I mean, some or the other languages will get mixed uh, in informal conversation, unless you are looking at predominantly English speaking you know, geographies. Um, and then finally, and very interestingly, code mixing has very well-defined socio-pragmatic functions. Uh, and I'll come in a moment what I mean by socio-pragmatic functions. But before that, I just want to you know, give you some statistics. So these are some studies we had done before. Uh, so this is a study of seven European languages uh, on Twitter. We looked at uh, several, uh, you know, large number of tweets and uh, try to see how much of code mixing was there. And, uh, you know, 3.5% of the tweets were code mixed. And if you look at, you know, different geographies, then uh, it happens everywhere. Like I said, uh, be it in Istanbul or be it in San Francisco, you see code mixed tweets everywhere, though the proportions vary. So for instance, in Istanbul, 13 to 14% of the tweets were code mixed, whereas in San Francisco or Houston, it was probably one to two percent. So that might vary, but uh, it nevertheless uh, is a ubiquitous phenomenon that happens everywhere. Now, the problem is if you are trying to build a technology or even a technological intervention, again, going back to the Swahili example, right? Uh, I mean, the WhatsApp group example. So we were trying to build an intervention that, uh, you know, whenever there is a extreme negative message or a toxic message, we want to flag it to the uh, group moderator, but it was very difficult to build such a technology because you know we had to build a sentiment detection uh, classifier or a sentiment classifier. And the problem there is, since it's code mixed, you can't use a English one, you can't use a Swahili one, and even if you try to build one which where English and Swahili both are mixed, there's not enough data sometimes, and our current models are not good enough, so you don't get uh, you know a good enough system that you could use or one could use reasonably well. So this is the problem. So all NLP techniques, uh, be it you know, your digital assistants like Cortana or Alexa, they need to handle code mixing, translation systems need to, and as I said, any kind of social media analytics need to. So this is uh, obvious reason. But then, uh, like I said, there is a very interesting aspect of code mixing, which is um, it's socio-pragmatic functions. So why do people code mix? Is it just a random thing that they do? I just know two languages, so I will keep switching between the two. It turns out it's not. There are lots of things like uh, topic change, puns, humor, etc., which trigger code switching. So uh, people have you know, particular languages, uh, preference towards particular languages when they are saying certain things. So these preferences could be along the dimensions of topic, along the dimensions of uh, sentiment and so on. And these were all linguistic observations which people have made um, for a long time. But in a, a more recent study, 
again on uh, Twitter uh, from India, tweets coming from India. So these are tweets from Hindi English bilinguals. What we observed is uh, a very interesting thing that, uh, you know, there is almost a 10 times more preference towards Hindi or switching into Hindi when somebody was uh, sharing a negative sentiment or somebody was trying to swear. Whereas um, English, on the other hand, was much more preferred for positive sentiments. And, and in fact, you could clearly see that language change often corresponds with changing sentiment within a tweet. So what it means is, you know, not only you won't be able to process all tweets properly, like detect sentiment, etc., if you are not doing code mixing properly, I mean, processing code mixing properly, but even there is a bigger danger for a computational uh, social science researcher, because if you were to draw inferences from data in a single or the majority language, uh, they ma are most likely to be misleading for multilingual society. You have to take care of all the languages. For instance, if you were uh, you know, trying to see what people's attitude towards a particular event, and you are looking at only English tweets coming from India, you might get a far more rosier picture. You might think, oh, it's mostly positive. But that's because you missed all the Hindi data where the negative sentiment was. So that's why it's a very, very crucial thing for especially doing uh, social science sort of studies. Now, so how should we, I mean, in a smaller scale, you can trade, you know, do manual analysis. But if you do want to do large studies like the ones I just described with 830,000 uh, know, tweets or uh, earlier the, tweet, uh, the study I discussed on Twitter had 50 million tweets, you simply cannot uh, do things manually. You have to automate it. Now, mm, the, of course, th there are various things that you can do. You have various options, but, but one simple thing, I mean, simple kind of pipeline to keep in mind is you might want to start with detection. First, want to detect if there is code mixing. And if there is code mixing, what are the languages that are mixed, right? So that is the first step. step. Once you know that there is code mixing. Uh, if you are not uh, speaking, can you please mute uh, your mics? Thank you. So uh, you might want to uh, you know, first detect. And then once you have uh, detected, you might want to do some basic NLP uh, you know, processing. Now that depends on your task. And finally, of course, you might want to do more sophisticated processing. So by basic NLP uh, processing, I might mean things, uh, we might mean things like um, you want to find the sentiment, you want to find the you know, parts of speech of certain words, et cetera. And, and more sophisticated things might be want to translate it to another language and so on. So, uh, so that's a high level pipeline to keep in mind. Now let's, let's talk about language detection and that will be the thing we will be focusing in this um, you know, tutorial. Uh, but before getting there, do you have any question till the part, I mean, till the broader points that I have covered so far? Please feel free to ask, uh, interrupt and ask. I don't see any now, but maybe they'll come okay. up later once we get into technical details. Sure. Uh, okay. So, so first, uh, there is an interesting, uh, you know, difference or a twist to language detection when it comes to code switching. So, language detection is a pretty uh, well-known problem. You might want to detect languages of documents or languages of, let's say, tweets, and you would find a lot of APIs around uh, which does language detection. However, for code switching, you are not detecting, uh, your need is to detect the language at word level because the switching happens at word level, right? So you cannot just detect it at an entire tweet level or an entire document level. So you have to be far more specific. So for instance, in this sentence, right? I know when you switch from English a uh, uh, Spaniel, so this part is Spanish and this is English. So for each word you have to detect. In fact, uh, this is an even uh, more complicated example. So here you can see, so uh, if you can read it, if you read both Hindi and English, you will understand, but the, it's not the point, understanding is not the point. You can see some of the words 
like speech and inspired are clearly english some of the these words which you don't understand if you don't read hindi are actually in hindi and uh, these are names uh, name of a country name of a people so we won't assign a language to it and this is a hashtag so we can call it something else so this is not also a part of language although you might also choose to you know call it english because uh, you know the hashtag can be interpreted only if you know english but that's besides the point for the time being let's say hashtags urls numbers etc we'll call other you know not assign any language all the words we will assign some language uh, and names we will call them as such they will mark them as names so now you see here the interleaving between the languages are far more hindi english hindi named entity english hindi hindi and so on so doing this uh, is is a challenge now one question people often ask at this point is can't we just use dictionaries turns out the dictionaries don't solve your problem for several reasons first is uh, named entities you know for many languages uh, named entities are part of dictionary words so for instance this is a valid hindi word this is a valid hindi word but actually these are not hindi words these i mean content full hindi words these are basically names of movies so you don't want to tag them as hindi and actually this is not a code mix sentence so that's one point problem second is ambiguity like for instance th in this tweet which where german and english is mixed you can see this word was is can be english or in another context it can be german similarly moment can be english as well as german war can be english as well as german so you have this kind of uh, you know ambiguities which you need to resolve based on the context then of course uh, there are spelling variations etc when you look at social media data and uh, there is often romanization so arabic hindi uh, you know uh, thai which are not usually written in roman script often when people code switch they do romanize so all these uh, are valid um, you know issues for which dictionaries don't help you so you have to do something more and one simple trick that uh, one could do is uh, you know learn a machine learning model and uh, you can use uh, word engrams uh, sorry character engrams as features so for instance um, let's say we want to classify this word um, inspired and classify into uh, you know whether it's english or hindi or whatever spanish and so on now uh, your classifier will give a score like a likelihood of this word being english or hindi or spanish so you can calculate that likelihood based on some features and these features could be simply you know character trigram so three character sequences so uh, ins is a three character sequence nsp is a three character sequence and so on so it need not be only trigrams you could use bigrams unigrams and combinations of all those and that's what actually we use in the system that sanad is going to talk uh, shortly uh, but just that doesn't solve it right it will just tell you what's the probability of this word being english or hindi or spanish and so on but you saw the case right there are ambiguities so for instance if it's was it could be both english and german now from the context you have to decide whether it's english or german so one simple way to do it is you could train a uh, um, you know some kind of a markov model or uh, um, you know sequence model so uh, here you assume that this is one language let's say english and this is another language let's say german and uh, these probabilities could be learned from the data but for the time being let's just assume we uh you know assign this probabilities you know just magically we know so we say that there is a very small probability pi let's say pi could be 0 0.01 or it could be 0.1 depending on your data set and with that probability you can go from l1 to l2 or l2 to l1 so that's a code switching probability and for for uh, for the rest of the time one minus pi you will see only l1 so it's like if the current word is l1 what's the probability that the next word is in l1 that's 1 minus pi or l2 that's pi so usually pi is small because you don't code mix very rapidly uh, you tend to be using i mean the next word tend to be of the same language as the previous word now if you subs, you know have this kind of a model and 
juxtapose it with a probability that you get from this n-gram analysis. So that gives you a very neat, um, you know, Markov models kind of an approach for this solving these tasks, which is essentially a sequence labeling task. So this is a sequence labeling task and it gives you a Markov modeling kind of an approach. Now, as I said, these probabilities could be learned from data if the data was annotated. If the data is not annotated, there are unsupervised, uh, you know, learning tricks you could do, or even simply learning pi from a dev set. You know, you can try, try with different values of pi and see, you know, what works well is also pretty reasonable, you know, and uh, the, the model that Sanad is going to describe uses pi as a, I mean, a fixed value of pi. But then uh, we did build a, a much more, uh, you know, sophisticated models. I won't have time into, uh, you know, to go into a great de deal of detail uh, of how these models work, but uh, they use the concept of a hidden Markov models. So the idea is like this. Um, so imagine that uh, I have uh, a model that can recognize whether this is a German text or not. So a German text will only alternate between German and some other tokens like hashtags. So hashtags, URLs, numbers, etc. right? So this, let's call it XG, XG is not German. So it can alternate between these English text. Uh, similarly, there could be a model that can recognize English and a model that can recognize French. Now you can you train these models very simply from monolingual data in German, English, and French. So these probability values can be simply trained from a monolingual data, which is pretty simple to acquire. See, the main problem why we are doing all these sophisticated things are sim uh, because we don't have enough data. Also, I want to mention many of you who are aware of deep learning. These are much, much uh, earlier. Uh, you know, we did all this work around 2015, 16. So deep learning was still not very fashionable and we did not have multilingual BERT and all those models at that time. So you, you might want to keep that in mind. Okay, but this is still not code mixing, right? Now, if you add edges like this in this model, then you can code switch between German and English. It allows you for, to move, you know, you were generating German, 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 and suddenly you are moving to English. And similarly, you can go to French and back to German and so on. So it doesn't even restrict you to only between German and English. You could do between any languages. Now, these kind of models are very powerful because it can simultaneously detect code mixing between any set of languages. So this was the model that we built to do the Twitter experiments where we tried to detect code mixing between seven languages. And indeed, there were tweets which had three-way mixing uh, of languages also. Of course, uh, very rare, but we did see some. And, uh, you know, I will just quickly flash, uh, you know, some numbers. The numbers are not important, uh, but the trend is important to understand. So, like I said, you could build a dictionary-based method, but the accuracy is far, far lower than if you do this kind of HMM-based methods. And with this HMM-based methods, you can easily reach to 95% or even 98% uh, accuracy at word level. So, these are pretty good models. They have to be fine-tuned a little bit, uh, but it, they, they ultimately, you know, can give you pretty good language detectors. So what we will do now is uh, we will do a hands-on session uh, where uh, how to use a language detector uh, and how can you train one by yourself. And after that, depending on the time, I will get into more uh, some, some more advanced text processing. So uh, at this point, uh, Sanad will take over. But while we do that, uh, if you have any question, let me know. Yeah, Sanad, you can start sharing your screen. Okay. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, Sanad here. So I've just posted a link to the notebook that we would be using for this session. Please let me know if you're able to open that notebook and let me share the screen. So is my screen visible? Okay, thanks. And <clears throat> So essentially, uh, thanks a lot, Moji, for talking in detail about and setting the context for this problem statement. The problem statement is given a sentence that has mixed language, how can you detect uh, word level language uh, from that sentence? And 
the tool that we are using is the simpler version of what Moji just said. So this works for two languages and you can reuse it for training it for any languages that you have. So I'll be trying, I'll be going through the notebook at a fixed pace, but in case you feel it fast, please feel free to interrupt me and ask any questions if you have. Now, uh, the data set that we are going to look at for this tutorial is something that we have custom made. And it's basically tweets from India that has Indian speakers talking about topics from India. Some of those tweets are code mix, some of them are not. And we'll be running this tool and see how things go. So I, I'm just going to start with the notebook. We first get the data that we have and we just read the data. So this is how our data looks like. So there are lots of tweets and then there are things like hashtags and user mentions. So you have English words like still can't believe, so on. And then you have some Hindi stuff. Then there are tweets like this, where these three words, yes, I, are actually Hindi words that are written in the English script. So this is how our data looks like at a high level. And initially what we're going to do is because it's sweets and data in the real world is never clean and easy. We have these URLs and these dots and dates and so on. So we just try to clean them up. So let's look at this one tweet and it's about a topic. We have this basic function where we do three things. We remove first uh, convert all the text to lowercase. Then we'll remove all the links and stuff and we only extract the alphabetic English alphabetic characters and hashtag and at the rate symbol, which we'll use in further in the tutorial. So this is how the tweet looks after cleaning. So if you compare it to the above tweet, you would see that the uh, case is fixed. You would see that URLs and hyphens, those things have been removed because for this particular example, we don't need them. Now we'll just run that entire sentence on the entire data set. So you had this raw tweets and then you have the clean tweets. You, it's fairly easy to see that things have changed and become slightly easier to manage. So now that we have this data that we have cleaned from Twitter, we would want to just do a very high level exploration of what kind of words or what kind of terms are like high frequency words. And that's why we have built this uh, word cloud. So basically the size of the word indicates the frequency of that word how can in the data set. Obviously, India is like high because these tweets are, we have tried to take it from the Indian subcontinent, the speakers from there, or whether they're talking about India. But the interesting thing is, apart from all the English words like footwear and design and so on, you have words, Hindi words like nahi, which is NAHL, and HAI, hey. And so these are actually English uh, Hindi words written in the Roman script. And this is just to show that the data has a lot of code mixing in it. Any questions so far? Oh, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. As someone who doesn't speak Hindi, are most of those words what we would consider stop words or are they verbs? Um, can you sort of explain those a little bit? Yeah, so I mean, the, it's kind of a mix of a lot of those things, but yeah, things, there are some verbs, there are some stop words, but yeah, you would also find uh, all kinds of uh, parts of speech in the Hindi words. Just like Moroji yeah. mentioned, yeah, Moroji. Yeah, so so it, it's it's an interesting question because in this um, image, particularly most of the Hindi words that are big are stop words, but uh, the smaller ones, you can see there are more, uh, you know, nouns and other things. Yeah. So thanks. Okay. So talking about the tool, uh, we it's we call it the LID tool. It's open source released by Microsoft on GitHub. And LID essentially means language identification. The tool is composed of two components. First is the ML classifier, which uh, Munujit has already discussed how it works. It uses engrams and those things. And apart from that, it we also use dictionaries, so we kind of try to combine the best of both worlds because what we realize in the real world is one approach can never be like perfect. So it's good to have as many approaches to cover corner cases. So 
Now these bunch of cells are essentially to download and set up the tool and they should run fairly fast and easily. So I would like you to follow along with me and just execute them. If anyone has any questions or doubt, or please feel free to ask. Would you recommend people only run this code like sort of in the cloud or like on a notebook or could they run this locally too if they wanted? Yeah, so it depends upon, uh, it's usually better to run this on Colab because there are some components that, that would require some kind of processing. And in terms of personal local computer, it depends upon the kind of configuration you have. So let me just... We run this cell. For some reason, I'm having some internet connectivity. Please excuse me for a while. Let me just read on this. By the way, are people able to run this cell and uh, get this downloaded? Just a quick question because I think I'm unfortunately having uh, some issue with my internet connection. I'm really sorry for that. Yeah, I'm having that too. So it could be just something on the, you know, the side of the host website as opposed to you. Um... Okay, so are you also not able to run this? Yeah, I'm, it's running right now. It just says it's having trouble connecting to that website. Um, so it could okay. just be the website itself is down rather than like it's, you know. Okay. Right. So I just turned it half an hour ago and it worked fine. So. Mm, okay. Yeah. Maybe a temporary blip in the website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe we can wait for a minute or more and then maybe we can just uh, continue with the notebook and see. Yeah. I mean, what do you have, um, I don't know if you already have like code that's already executed and you have results, but it's also okay to just like you know, show cells with like, here's the result you would see if this was able to run. Yeah, let me just uh, look up the code. Just give me a minute. Yeah. Um, I guess while we're waiting, I had a question for um, Monaji based on one of those HMM models you showed. Yeah. Sure. Um, cool. Yeah. It seems like most of those were like, I guess for code in general, you're kind of assuming that like it's at the word level, right? That it's sort of like one word goes to the next and that's your transition. Is that correct? Uh, sorry, can, could you repeat the question? Yeah, again? no, I, um, I was just asking about with those HMM models, is the assumption that like each state is a single word? Um, so like when you go from one state to another, it's like, okay, I'm at word one. Okay, when I go to word two, it goes to the next state. Is that it? Okay. Yeah, so each state is a word. So basically the observations in the states are words. Oh, uh, okay, cool. Yeah, I was just wondering, because I wonder if there are some like phrases where 
even when you're going from word to word, like it's less likely that there's code switching, like within a noun phrase, for example, I wonder if there's like maybe less code switching versus like, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's not a problem if the uh, switching is between two words. The problem would be like if within a word there is code switching, uh, if you are asking that, and that also happens, but uh, it's a little, it's rare. And uh, it happens only in very uh, highly inflectional languages, but otherwise it's not that common. In, in that case, you have to basically tokenize and uh, break words into further sub words and work on them. Yeah, I guess that could be an issue in something like German where they tend to have very like long words that could be some. Yeah, in Hindi also we see that um, sometimes so you would take an English noun and append a, let's say Hindi suffix to it. So it's not, uh, I mean, it happens, but uh, like I said, it's not extremely common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so it wasn't common enough that, uh, you know, we felt a need to do that when we were doing our experiments. Oh, okay. I'd put it that way. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess in those cases where you have like inter intra word code mixing, do you think your model would just like assign it to one bucket over the other and just like this is probably Hindi? Yeah. So the model will probably assign it based on what the surrounding words are. Oh, okay. If the surrounding words are more English, then probably it will say it's English. Mm, uh, and okay. so on. Cool. So I guess that would that answers another question I had, which was about loan words. Um, so like in English, we have lots of loan words like burrito, salsa, sushi. I guess in that case, because the context is kind of predominant, then your model would say, okay, this looks a little funny, but it's surrounded by English. So we're just going to call it English. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it, I mean, that's uh, these are all very interesting challenges, actually. Yeah. So uh, one problem is uh, tagging loan word itself is challenging because uh, like in some of our work, we showed that it's a kind of a continuum mm. between clear loan words and clear mixing because it's an ongoing process yeah. of borrowing that's happening. Mm -hmm. So sometimes even, um, you know, so, so if you see a word like sushi in an English context, probably you will not tag it as Japanese or something. Mm -hmm. uh, however, there might be other words, I don't know. Mm, uh, uh, which which might be I mean English Jap I mean it uh, in Hindi I know many such examples which mm. are not clear whether it, they are yet to call a loan word or not uh -huh. so that's one problem the other problem is uh, while this uh, surrounding word helps but sometimes that also causes errors because suppose it's a genuinely code mixed Hindi word mm -hmm. but everything around the entire sentence are all English so then it tends to mark it as English. Oh, okay. So in that case, the context so, kind of overwhelms the like local features. Right, right. Um, okay. So that that we have seen um, quite a bit, uh, especially, I mean, if just the entire thing is in one language and just one word somewhere is another, it tends to miss those. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, I guess to be fair, humans would probably miss that too. I mean, if I'm speaking to someone and they code mix like one word, I might just kind of like blank it out or like not realize that they switched. So yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> fair to assume computers might miss that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Sonad, I know the link is broken. Maybe for the sake of time, could you just sort of explain like what the rest of the notebook kind of does cell by cell and then like what people will find if they run it on their own later once the uh, link is working? Yeah, yeah, I think I'll do that. So um, I don't know why it's happening like this because we have uh, <laughs> run similar session for a larger crowd and so I don't think it's the crowd or it's probably something happening from the uh, side of the server. So mm -hmm. we are using an open source tool, Malik, and probably something is wrong with the website. So I'm really sorry for that. I'll try my best to explain things and give some examples. Mm -hmm. So bear with me and yeah, let me share my screen. Right. Is this visible? Yes. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, the tool it tries to take in the uh, sentence level input and uh, extract word level language tags. Let me show you the kind of sample input we have. So, so this 
So is my screen, this is visible, right? So this, these are the sample input we have. We have four sentences. So first sentence is, ye mera pehla sentence hai, which basically means this is my first sentence. The first three words, ye mera pehla are Hindi words. Sentence is an English word, hai is a Hindi word. The second and the third sentence have all the Hindi words and the fourth sentence has all the English words. Now the interesting thing here is the second word, uh, the second sentence has the word M-A-I-N, main, which is also in the fourth sentence, but even though the, they're spelled the same way, they're actually different, uh, they hold different contextual meanings. The main in the English, in the uh, fourth sentence is actually an English word, while the main in the third sentence means me, which is a Hindi word written in the Roman script. Now this is, these are some of the corner cases where you really want the tool to work because you can't predict how people will write a different non-English language when they're using the Roman script. So essentially what I was going to talk about was, this is the, these are sentences, we run the tool and we notice that these, this word me is actually marked as English along with this word uh, me, which is actually English. Now the way to handle this is something that we have come up with, which is basically how we combine the best of both worlds of using the dictionaries and the ML model. So the pipeline gets the input text and you break those texts into two sections, whether those uh, words are present in the dictionary or if they are not. If they are not, you just extract the features, pass it to the ML model and you get some probabilities. If they are, then you extract uh, the labeling that they have in the dictionary and do a bunch of stuff. So first is, there can be two prominent cases. The first case is the words that you are pretty sure can only belong to the, one of the languages. For example, the word advisor. It's really difficult for the word advisor, uh, for any Hindi word to be spelled as advisor. But there's, there are words like this M-A-I-N M-A or the word like T-O-2 which can have an Hindi meaning or an English meaning. So if your words you're very sure belong to a single language, you put them in those specific language dictionaries, say English or Hindi, and you just force the tool to give preference to the dictionary output. If you see that there are these conflicting words, which can be, which can belong to both the languages, like they basically they're spelled the same way. What you do is you put them in both the dictionaries, and this kind of instructs the tool saying that this is a conflict word. It can even be English or the Hindi word. So in that case, along with the dictionary uh, input, it will try to look signals from the ML model and also the surrounding words. So in this case, the ML model would probably give a higher probability that it's English, but because we know that in both the dictionaries, this word is present. So the tool knows it can also be Hindi. So be careful about that. So in that case, what it will see is, it sees that the words kya and karu are actually Hindi words. And thus the large majority of the surrounding words actually belong to Indian. It tries to take in all these three signals and then it labels them me correctly as Hindi and this as English. So that's what this uh, section of the notebook was about. When you want to create these dictionaries, these are the two questions you want to ask for any language pairs. It can be any English, Chinese or English, Spanish, which is basically, there will be a section of words which you would be very sure belong to either of the languages and cannot interchange. And then there will be these section of words that can belong to more than one language and you want them to be present in both the dictionaries. There's more details in quote and docs. So you can go ahead and read out how you can do that. Apart from this, the next section was, uh, we, we have already uh, in the interest of time labeled uh, the entire corpus of 510 tweets and using the LID too. And just, we were trying to run some basic aggregation things on top of that. So this is how the output looks like. The user mentions is like slash other, welcome is English, two is English, all those things. Then you would find some Hindi words like khatm khatam, which means finished and it's slash hi. So basically slash hi, slash en and slash other. So this is how it looks like. And then what we do is, we have all these tag tweets. We can do start with basic aggregation. So the first aggregation is what are the ratio of tweets that are predominantly English, predominantly Hindi, or kind of balanced in terms of code mixing. 
So the way we calculate that is we say, suppose we set a threshold of 70%. So 70% words of a sentence, if they belong to English, then we say that the sentence is predominantly English, vice versa for Hindi. And if there is no clear 70% majority, we say it's code mixed. Now this 70% is a threshold that we are arbitrarily chosen. You can change this value and rerun this code and you would find different outputs. So this is how the table looks like. Let me just see what are the categories counts. You would see that English is 199, Hindi is 51, 231 is code mix. And let's closely look at the kind of tweets we have. So when you do CM double equal to one, you're saying, show me all the tweets, which are code mix. You can change it to EN or HI and you would find the respective tweets. So if you try to open this sentence, you would see, I've already calculated for the first sentence, but basically it has like equal number of like five, six words in English, five, six words in Hindi. So it's kind of no clear language has clear majority. But if you suppose want to do say, you click on this and now you have all the words. Let me just, just change this flag to English. We run the cell. So now these tweets, if you make the, the table bigger, you would see that a lot of words, I mean, it's, give me a minute. Right. So you would see that a lot of words in these sentences are English. So it's, these are the sentences that have predominantly one language. Similarly, you can do it for HI and you can run the code. The second thing that we were trying to do was, let's try to, let's try to figure out some kind of pattern why code mixing is happening. So if you remember when we were cleaning our data set earlier, we had removed URLs and links, but we had not removed things like hashtags and the, at the rate symbol. The reason for that is these two things actually have some kind of information for us. So now what we do is we have these tweets, we extract the hashtags and the user mentions for each tweet. And then we just do a bunch of uh, analysis and what we are seeing in manual analysis is a lot of times when people are, uh, when the Twitter accounts that belong to news outlets, they usually talk about formal topics and they usually use a single language predominantly and it's mostly English. A lot of times when we see code mixing happening or if uh, the tweets are like predominantly Hindi, what we see is these are individual user accounts who are just talking about their day-to-day -day lives. They're expressing the emotions just they would do in like real world. So that's kind of the overall pattern that we see. Obviously, this is a very short number of tweets. You would want to do a bigger quantitative study in order to get even more concrete uh, uh, hypothesis tested. But the point is, this is just one example of what you can do if you have a Twitter data set and you have a tool like this for which you can extract what level language tags. You could take it even further. And I, I remember Moji were talking about puns and uh, topic change and humor. So you could even test, you know what? There is a classifier that will tell you or there are certain words, suppose the word joke, if it's happening and those things, sarcasm, where exactly code mixing is happening. But yeah, I'm really sorry that we couldn't run the entire notebook, but this notebook has all the instructions all the explanations given and all the papers and the documentation link. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. So any questions as of now, please ask me. I'll be happy to take. Um, yeah, just a reminder, you can send your question in the chat or raise your hand. Um, I guess for now, um, I'll ask the question, which is, um, uh, how easy is it to come up with different dictionaries? I know in this example, you have English versus Hindi. Um, I don't know if those other dictionaries or other languages already exist or if that's something that people would have to do on their own. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think one of the creative ways where we found the dictionary was we used, uh, I think Mojit can correct me if I'm wrong, but we used the Hindi and English movie scripts. So you have this uh, movie scripts with dialogues and what you would find is they will be written in Roman script, but they would be like essentially Hindu dialogues. So you can extract them at a large scale and just try to uh, create dictionaries with them. But it's, it always helps if you can have 
do some kind of analysis on the kind of words this tool is consistently uh, getting wrong for your language pair and just note them down with help of like those kind of early analysis. But it, should, it shouldn't be uh, hard uh, to do something like that. Yeah, Monoji. No, that's correct. Yeah, no, I didn't mean to say anything. Cool. Um, I guess I have another question. It looks like this notebook is primarily about tweets. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, would you recommend that people like try to extend this to other domains or do you think like this is should be primarily used in like social media data where there's more likely to be mixing? Um, sort of what are your thoughts about data domains? Yeah, I think so. One of the things about code mixing is uh, what we have seen is it usually happens a lot on social media data like chat platforms. It happens a lot in speech and basically informal context because usually if it's like a government document or if it's like a say uh, any scientific publication you would find that things are like primarily in one language but usually in informal day-to-day -day settings which is a lot of uh, like the nlp data and a lot of nlp context so that's where a lot of code mixing happens very high in social media Yeah, but in terms of, uh, you know, changing the domain, that wouldn't be a difficult problem here. It's just the data is coming from social media. Definitely, yeah, yeah it's just the availability. You just go with what's available. Yeah. Yep. So uh, if there are no other questions, uh, I, I can just wrap up with a few more points. Okay, uh, I'll quickly share my screen again. Yeah, can you see the screen? Yep, you're good. Yep, okay. Yeah, so uh, if you want to do more things, uh, you know, more sophisticated uh, processing, let's say, for example, sentiment analysis, then what should you do? So uh, there, there are at high level, a uh, couple of different uh, ways that people can use. So one is you could actually collect a lot of code mixed annotated training data and then build your model from scratch. So that's a vanilla method, but it's probably you are not going to do that because um, you know that's hard uh, to, and you need a lot of data and so on. The other way which we used uh, you know, earlier is uh, use the language detection tool that you have built to split the um, you know, input into L1 fragments and L2 fragments, and then apply monolingual models to each part. Now, this works only when you know you have sufficiently long L1 fragments and sufficiently long L2 fragments, and not much interleaving. For instance, one sentence in one language, another sentence in another language, and so on. But uh, it won't work when within a sentence or phrase, people are mixing languages, because then you are losing the context by splitting the fragments away. So it does give some accurate, I mean, it's not like very bad, but depending on the uh, text or the domain, it could be pretty bad also. But the most efficient approach, uh, which, uh, you know, right now seems to be uh, the best way of solving this problem is uh, through using these uh, massively multilingual models like MBERT or XLM Robota. So uh, these models uh, come pre-trained with a large number of languages. And suppose the language pair or uh, the languages which are mixed that you are interested in are all there in this pre-trained set. So these are trained on typically 100 languages. And if, you are, if that's within that, if it's not within that, then unfortunately we can't use this technique. But if those, your languages of interest are included in this, then what you can do is, you know, train this particular model, let's say MBERT or XLM Roberta, uh, you know, build a classifier, let's say only using data for, for one of the languages that you have. Let's say I'm interested in English in the code mix sentiment analyzer. I have lots of English sentiment annotated data. So I fine tune the model with only English data that I have, but, and then it 
because of the zero shot transfer capability, it starts working on code mix languages as well. And for some systems, right, like XLM Robota, um, we have seen that it works very, very well uh, for certain pairs of languages like English, Spanish, and so on. Of course, English, Swahili, and all, it doesn't work that well because Swahili, the amount of Swahili data in these systems are, um, I mean, the pre-training data that's there is not much. So those problems aside, it does work, but you can make it even better. How? So one way is to, you know, pump in a little bit of um, L1, L2 code mix data uh, while pre-training the model. So if you have a lot of unlabeled L1, L2 code mix data, you can make the system even better by pre-training. Or if you have L1, L2 code mix labeled data, you could use it during fine tuning. So then it will work like a few shot case. So the best situation is when you have this data. So then you get very high accuracy if you have training data, right? Even a little bit of, let's say, thousand examples, it, it works uh, pretty well. If it isn't there, then even with unlabeled data, you could do a little bit better. So these are the common tricks that you could uh, do. Now, where do you find data? That's the hardest problem. And it depends on which languages you are interested in. So uh, some data sets, uh, there are many data sets that exist, but there are these benchmarks. One is called Glucose, Glue for Code Switching, and one is called Lincy. These benchmarks cover a lot of these data sets. So these are go-to place for several data sets. So you could try. So Glucose uh, only focuses on English Hindi and uh, English Spanish code mixing, but a large number of tasks using uh, some very low level tasks like language detection to high level tasks like NLI. Whereas uh, Lindsay has more, um, you know, wide coverage of languages, but fewer tasks. So you can go and find uh, in those places, but there are many other places also where you can, uh, you know, find the data sets. And uh, some of these resources um, have uh, more details on how you can build these systems. There are a couple of um, uh, other open source repositories, one which uh, we built, uh, it's called a code mixing stack, where uh, you can even generate artificial code mix data and use them for training. So if you have, let's say, sentiment analysis data for English, you can artificially mix it with Hindi. So those kind of capabilities are possible. So those are also options for generating data artificially. And, and of course, if, if you can get your own data annotated, then uh, all the methods I described previously could be used as well. Yep, so that's pretty much uh, it I wanted to talk about. But let me know, you know, if you have any questions from from the entire tutorial. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that last little wrap up. Um, yeah, does anyone have any last questions for Monaji or Sanad while they're here? Um, now's the time to ask away. Yeah, I just want to point out that the notebook is working fine, and probably some unfortunate <laughs> timing that their server chose to. Uh, so it's working fine, and please feel free to go through it and send us any questions. We'll, I think Ian will be sharing this notebook along with the slides to post this talk. That's great, thanks. Yeah, it seems like it wasn't a problem on your end. It was just a problem on the remote server's end. Uh, yeah, I guess I had a quick question, which was um, related to some of like the neural models you were just talking about, the like sort of um, Roberta type stuff. I guess, do you think those would be a little bit more intensive to like implement and test out for most like CSS people or um, compared to like the LID stuff that um, Sanad presented earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I missed the question. Can you please? Yeah, no, just um, do you think it would be like more intensive for most social science people to like implement that um, sort of transformer based code mixing detection as compared to the sort of pipeline that we saw in the notebook today? I don't think it will be very difficult. Uh, depends. I mean, these days things are pretty easy, um, but they do uh, need some access to compute resources. Mm. Uh, and, and many of these systems uh, might, uh, models might already exist. It depends totally on the languages they are interested in. Mm. So Spanish, English, Arabic, English, um, even a bit of Indonesian, English, Hindi, English. So these are languages which people have done uh, quite a bit of work. So people might 
just get hold of off the shelf tools but if somebody is working on you know a new language then they might have to build something from scratch mm. yeah okay got it great well yeah we're over time so thank you both for staying over time and um yeah that ends this tutorial so i'll stop the recording